Pre run the journey's end is incredible. I fucking told you. Plot summary. Freerun The Journey's End follows the titular elf mage Freerun along with her apprentice slash adopted daughter Fern and Fern's totally not boyfriend Stark on their journey up north to the place where souls of the dead go to rest. Why are they on this journey you may ask? Well because 80 years ago Freerun went on a journey with a couple of other dumb humans and a dumb dwarf to defeat the Demon King, then when they did, she faded out to go look for new magic to study, and then after about 50 years, she decided to check in on one of her companions, Hamble the Hero, who had a crush on her, but she never really noticed because she's autistic. It happens to the best of us. Seeing that the man's health wasn't the best, she gets the band back together to watch the same meteor shower that they watched together 50 years earlier. Sometime later, Himmel passes away, and Freerun finds herself distraught that she never tried to get to know him better. She knew humans live short lives compared to her own near infinite lifespan as an elf, but she never bothered to get to know the guy, learn more about his likes and dislikes, what he was passionate about, or what he wanted to do with his life beyond their journey's end. And that's what this new journey is about for Freerun. Not only getting the chance to let Hill know that she did care for him, but to also make sure the people around her know that she cares about them too. End of summary. Pros. I absolutely adore these characters, especially Freerun herself. I love the almost apathetic tone of voice used by her English voice actor Mallory Rodak, especially how it can betray so much emotion under the right circumstances. Like when she's confronting Ara the Guillotine, a demon she fought 80 years earlier during her journey with Himmel and the others. And she makes a comment about how Himmel in life had chastised her to use less show-offy magic. And Ara asks, why would Freerun care? Because that dumb human is dead. Freerun pauses and replies, thank you for saying that. You reminded me that demons are just monsters. Now I can kill you without mercy. But on the flip side, there's an incredible warmth to her, like when she spends an entire episode shopping for Fern's birthday, or when she praises Stark for killing the dragon in his first episode. You were exceptional. That was quite the show. Well done. She genuinely loves her companions, and after having forgotten to tell her first group of friends that when they were all alive, she makes a point to make sure she tells her new group that whenever she thinks she ought to. And tell everyone you love them! Don't be like our fathers! It took, it took my old man 55 fucking years to say he loves me! I love each and every one of you! Do you understand that? Because you put your bodies on the line! I love all of you! And on the less sentimental side, the woman is such a little shit. I love how for Fern's birthday she gets her a lovely little hair clip, but for Stark she gets him a potion that can make clothes dissolve. In the season finale, Freerun is told she's barred from the magical institution for the next 1,000 years because she pissed off Ciri, her late master's master. And instead of being angry or sad, Freerun just glumly remarks that the woman really is a centuries-old child. And I also really love her keep-it-simple-stupid approach to combat magic. In the old days, she would throw around those splashy spells that wreak havoc and destruction, but now she's just spamming basic offense and defense. She can fire off those grand displays of power, but she's saving energy this way, and she's also endearing less attention from other people. It's actually quite brilliant. So to put it simply, Freerun might actually be one of my top five anime characters. And she definitely ain't five. I love Burn so much. I love her sweetness. I love her grumpiness. I love her quick wits. I love her obvious crush on Stark. I love how she starts out so fucking strong as a mage. She gets even fucking stronger under Freerun. And I love her loyalty. Her genuine loyalty to Freerun. There's a bit where Ciri offers to teach Fern, and Fern politely declines because she already has a teacher, and that's Freerun. And I especially love how much she loved Father Hyter, the priest who raised her and was a part of Freerun's party to defeat the Demon King. The man saved her life when she was at her lowest point, and so now Fern's only goal is to become the best mage she can be, purely to make Father Hyter proud. And you know what? I'm pretty sure he would be. Stark is the epitome of a cowardly lion. The man has the strength to literally move mountains, but he's often too timid to use it. But when he does use it, oh boy, 
you best be glad he's one of the good guys because this man killed a dragon with one fucking swing of his axe. Just one. One god fucking damn axe swing. And it was game over for that thing. And talking about the man himself and not just his accomplishments. I like how he's just kind of a guy. He's a bit of a dork who sometimes doesn't know his own strength, but is always quick to help out for a cause. And I really love his admiration for his mentor, Isen, the dwarf warrior who accompanied Freyrin and Himmel's quartet of adventurers. At one point in the show, Stark and the gang have to stick around in some lord's castle because Stark bears a striking resemblance to the man's deceased son. And he wants them to make one last appearance to reassure people that he's alright. And during their stay, the lord confides in Stark that before he lost his son, the last time they spoke to each other, they said very cruel things to each other. And now he wishes that they'd been kinder to each other before he passed. And Stark admits that he hopes that after his journey with Vern and Freyrin ends, that he'll be able to see his mentor one more time, so he can apologize for the last thing he said to them before they parted. You know what? I hope he does too. I really like Freyrin's mentor, Flam, and Flam's own mentor, Ciri. Where Flam loves magic with all her heart, Ciri almost seems to view it as a tool. The two women clearly respected and loved each other, but it's also pretty clear they also never saw eye to eye. Flam wants to create a world where magic can be used by anyone and everyone. Siri, on their hand, thinks magic is a special tool that should only be used by those who are most capable and most prepared. So, of course, when Flam inevitably dies before Siri, because Flam was a human and Siri is an elf, she wills that her master teach magic to the rest of the world. And what I like is that Siri clearly hates this idea, but she still does it because Flam was more than just her student. She watched her grow from a little girl to a grown woman and loved her like a daughter. Even if she never got her, she adored her and she'll choke it down happily, do what would have made her little human happy. And going back to Flam, what I especially love is how she basically fostered all of Freyrin's instincts as a mage. The woman literally says that because she and Freyrin love magic, they are the only ones allowed to disrespect it, especially when it comes to using dirty tricks in combat, like how they specifically hide their mana, the field showing how strong their magic is. When another mage looks at Freyrin, Fern, or Flam, they only see a pretty weak field only surrounding their immediate personal space. When they stop suppressing it, they see a vast field covering several feet. This was a trick Freyrin learned from Flam and then taught to Fern, and was even taken up by Ciri, albeit in a much different way for a much different reason. She represses her mana to about the same size as Freyrin's when Freyrin isn't suppressing her mana. But when she drops the suppression, her field takes up the entire building for the Continental Mage Association. Well, Flam, Freerin, and Fern use the technique to specifically trick demons into thinking they're weak, so they'll underestimate them and in turn be easier to destroy, Ciri does this specifically as a test. If someone can notice that she's even stronger than she appears to be, they're likely someone with a lot of potential. If they can see through her, they might be worthy of her personal attention. I really hope these two stay in the story going forward. I haven't read the manga, so if they do appear more, sweet! And if they don't, darn. Himmel, Father Heiter, and Aizen are all great characters as well. I'd be curious to see a prequel centered on the adventure of Freerin's original traveling party, but I also feel like it would defeat the purpose of this series. Either way, these guys are great. The other various mages from the first class exam are all great characters too. I love the bickering lesbians, the sociopathic scissors girl, and I really love the old man who's a pretty strong mage, but I especially like him because of the bit where once he's run out of mana and can't use his magic anymore, he just rolls up his sleeves and says, I'm out of magic, but I'm not out of options, and then starts throwing hands with people. No serious thoughts on any of these characters, aside from the old man, they're all just really cool. The animation, character designs, and backgrounds in this series are all absolutely gorgeous. Hats off to you, Madhouse, for this one. You guys made a damn great looking piece of television. The music is also really pretty too, so many gorgeous pieces in this series. And if you want proof of that, just go look up Stark's fight with that dragon from earlier, and then come back and thank me later. A big salute to composer Evan Call. Well done, sir. Cons. I only have one real complaint with this show, and that's the demons. Or rather, their lack of depth. I watched a few other reviews for this series just to see what other people are thinking about it, and 
While the general consensus is pretty positive, the subject of the demons seems to be a bit contentious. Some people don't mind it, and some people really do. So with that being said, apologies in advance if you've heard this criticism before and you're tired of it, but with that said, what actually is the problem with the demons? Well, in their first appearance, they're shown as just generic monsters. They seem intelligent enough to speak and reason their way through problems, but their main desire is to just destroy. And that sounds pretty simple and pretty expected for demons, but then the next episode to feature demons in a significant way opens up an interesting question. Can demons, for want of a better term, be human? We see a flashback to when Freer and Himmel and the others were in a village attacked by a demon who took the shape of a human child. And after defeating her, a villager takes pity on the demon and offers to give her a home in the hope of teaching them how not to be a monster. It opens up a genuinely interesting question. Can a monster become something better? And the episode immediately slams the door on that question with a resounding nope. When we see that the demon murdered the leader of the village and stole his daughter to present to the villager who took her in as a way to make up for killing their daughter before the episode started. Which itself is actually pretty interesting. There's a trope I really like called Blue and Orange Morality. The idea that while human beings have our own concept of what morality is and what's acceptable, a character from a completely different species would have a very different idea of what is moral and what is acceptable. And our different concepts of morality would likely clash. A demon who realized killing an innocent child was wrong might think the best way to make up for that would be to present that child's parent with a new child, not knowing that humans don't see other humans as interchangeable. This idea leads nowhere, however, when Himmel who gave the demon a chance earlier, now regrets his choice and ends this miserable creature for good. Before the demon is killed, it calls out for their mommy. And as the demon fades out of existence, Freeran questions why the demon called out for their mother when they don't even know what a mother is. The demon admits that Freeran is right and explains that whenever she says that, humans tend to hesitate just long enough for her to kill them first. According to Freeran, Demons only have the ability to speak so that they can lie and trick humans so that they can murder them. Which on the one hand, I mean, yeah, they're literally demons. What would you expect? But on the other hand, I just think evil fantasy races is kind of a lame trope to fall back on when you've opened up such an interesting question. I'm reminded of the wraiths from Stargate Atlantis, an alien species that feed off of the life force of human beings. Sort of like a science fiction vampire. None of the wraiths ever fully cross over into being good guys, but there are plenty of occasions where wraiths are shown to be capable of being reasonable and even compassionate at times, such as the character of Todd. In his first appearance, Todd and the main character John Shepard are both being held captive by members of a rival third faction called the Genai. Todd is repeatedly allowed by the Genai to feed on John, until the two men conspire to work together to break out and get back in touch with their people. After being found by the fellow members of John's expedition, Todd uses the strength he took from the Jedi soldiers to restore John back to full health. In exchange for Todd's kindness, John and his team agree to let Todd go free, but warns him that if the two of them ever meet each other again, they will probably be enemies and John will try to kill him. Todd Riley suggests that it'd probably be the best for the both of them if they didn't see each other again. Todd is still a monster who willfully feeds on the life force of other humans and probably went on to kill plenty of other people after this, completely unrelated to his later experiences with the Atlantis expedition, but he's also amendable and friendly and capable of being reasonable and making negotiations and can deal in good faith. The demons in Freerin are just human-shaped monsters. Later in the arc, established by the flashback of the child-shaped demon, we see a group of demons who are seemingly there to negotiate a truce with a local town, but it's of course all a ruse so they can figure out how to bypass the magical shield protecting the town from the demons who haven't been allowed inside. Once they can let everyone else inside, they're going to slaughter the entire city because that's just who they are and what they do. It's all they are. That's all they'll ever be. And for a series that's so wonderfully rich thematically, I think it's a little disappointing that the mangaka and the writers for this anime just decided, nah, the demons are pure evil, full stop. Aside from the shit with the demons, this show is fucking awesome. If you'll permit me to get a bit personal, I found this show at a really interesting time in my life. I started watching this show in like mid-April, a few weeks before my 30th birthday, but also a few days after the 30th anniversary of Michael Jan's passing. He was a really big part of my life. And thinking about those two things at the same time as watching this show really put me in a weird mindset, in a weird headspace. It's a period of mourning, but also a period of getting ready to reach a really big milestone. And 
to think about that in the context of also thinking about Freerun's relationship with both time and with other people in general, and also just think about people's relationship to, well, relationships, it, it really had to be thinking. We don't always really consider the impact we leave on others and the impact they leave on us. But when it dawns on you, it really hits you in a big way. And when the people we love pass, there's always this deep regret that we never got to say everything we wanted to say, whether it's just simple things or things that were really important. Me personally, to talk about my uncle again, I last saw him around Easter 2021. And a little bit before this, I'd been doing a series on my TikTok where I watched and reviewed every single WrestleMania from the original in 1985 to that year's WrestleMania 37. And my mom had mentioned to me that her brother, my uncle, was a big fan back in the golden age of guys like Hulk Hogan, Andre the Giant, the Macho Man Randy Savage, Shake the Snake, and Sergeant Slaughter. And when I heard that, I really wanted to talk to him about some of these golden age wrestling shows I'd been watching. But when I saw him, we were at a church function, and he was helping serve dinner during a potluck. So I let it go because I figured I would have a chance to talk to him again. I would always have a chance to talk to him again. And then again came, but he was wrapped up in a conversation with my mom. So again, I figured I'd have another chance similar time. Except I didn't get that chance. And all this time later... I still really regret that I didn't get to ask him about all these stupid wrestling shows. I can't even begin to say how much I wish I could go back in time and talk with him about those shows with the Macho Man and Hulk Hogan, but that's not possible. So we just have to make sure that the people we love know that we love them right now. Don't uh, just wait around until they're on their deathbed. Don't, don't go see them in the hospital when they're comatose and just hope that they can hear you. Tell them today while still alive and healthy. And that's what I really appreciated about Free Ring. While there's plenty of exciting action sequences and some really good comedy, the thing I love most about it is the way that it reminds us all to take advantage of the time we have with the people we love. Make connections, form bonds, start relationships, create friendships. Love people without hesitation. I'm going to give Free Ring The Journey's End a 5 out of 5. Special shout out to the one and only Adeem the Artist, an especially delightful queer country folk singer I asked them over Twitter if I could use their song, Live Forever, in this video over a month ago, and they very graciously gave me a green light. Please check out their work. Their albums, Cast Iron, Pansexual, and White Trash Revelry, are truly some wonderful gems of crunchy folk music, filled to the brim with insightful and poetic tunes about all sorts of topics. I really liked using Live Forever for this video in particular because of how it talks about encouraging people to just move on after the singer has passed but also makes clear what the best way to remember them would be once they're gone. When I'm dead and gone, I hope I carry on in some way, but you better never hold my dirt in a stuffy old church. Lord knows I never live by the letter. You just sing one of my songs from time to time. It's the only way I live forever. It's the only way I'm gonna live forever. You just sing one of my songs from time to time. Thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed this review. If you did, please like this video and subscribe to my channel. I don't talk that much about anime on this channel, but I do have a few videos up discussing the Yu-Gi-Oh! series as well as the last Dragon Ball movie. If that sounds interesting, feel free to check out the playlist below. As for what's going to come in the future, my current plan is doing a video discussing Fox's X-Men series, all my videos discussing Spy X Family, Yu-Gi-Oh! GX Season 2, and hopefully WWE's Kofi Mania. And all that sounds interesting, then please stay tuned. Have a great day, everyone. Woodstock, out. Mm -hmm.